Is, uh, you are mute, John. Oh, there we go. <laughs> but you're mute, not mine. Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. We're glad that you could join us today. We've had uh, some some land bank related webinars in the past. That I think as we get farther into the program, the, they are becoming more important, and land banks are becoming kind of the one of the bigger outlier activities, uh, the, as we would have guessed all along. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I kind of wanted to let you know what we will and won't be covering uh, today. We, we will not be covering big picture, long-term, 10-year type strategies for land banks because we have 10 years to do that. Uh, but you, have, you, you all have strategies, I'm sure, but uh, that's less of an uh, imminent uh, issue than uh, what we're going to talk about today, which is how can we uh, get as many properties out of the NSP land bank as possible. And so this will be a fairly transactional, kind of pro project-specific type of um, discussion, and hopefully we'll give you some ideas of ways to cut down on the uh, inventory in your NSP land bank. And we're going to have a couple of uh, polls along the way to let us know uh, Kind of what the, who's out there and what kind of size of land banks you have or properties, but but we are referring to any property that you hold uh, in this conversation as a disposition or a land bank uh, conversation. This is uh, not limited to formal land banks, which are generally uh, nonprofit and independent nonprofits or uh, or city or county agencies, but. Um, so we'll touch on some of the larger strategies, but we really wanted to uh, kind of help you zero down the, the list of properties that you have to worry about as far as NSP is concerned. Now, that's not to say that it's not important to have a long-term strategy, and it's definitely not to say that you shouldn't worry about having land bank property turn into the best possible use that you can turn it into. That's, that's all of our goal. But uh, that, some of those things can happen a little more quickly, and some of them happen a little uh, over a long time, longer period of time, depending on <clears throat> on your real estate market and so forth. So, um, but we do have uh, technical assistance available if you have uh, struggling, uh, if you're struggling with your land bank and, and your uh, unsold properties, uh, we can get um, some uh, advice out to you pretty quickly. Larry's handling that, and I would say also. Uh, even though we didn't put a specific plug in it uh, for the technical assistance for closeouts, we are now having technical assistance available for uh, problem solving. Uh, we f we find that uh, a lot of a lot of places would like to close their grants out, but they don't even uh, have all their DRGR uh, uh, books reconciled with. Uh, uh, their own uh, local accounts, or there's still properties left over, or there's there's just issues that are uh, bugging you. So you can now get help for those kind of problems, and then we think, we hope, that will clean the decks for you and allow you to proceed through the closeout procedure, which in itself isn't all that complicated. It's getting to it. Uh, so, so you can, uh, as of this moment, uh, write into NSP hyphen questions, plural, right, mm -hmm. at HUD.gov, NSP dash questions at HUD.gov, and we can get you, tell us who you are and what you need and, uh, and kind of describe your problem a little bit, your situation, and we'll try to get somebody out. This, this is going to be, for the most part, um, remote technical assistance by telephone, but we can uh, authorize uh, 16 hours initially and another 14 hours, so that's a lot of TA time. You should be able to solve pretty much all your problems with that. And if it's if you got a really difficult situation, we could even decide to go to uh, direct technical assistance, which could be a, a live uh, uh, engagement, but that takes a little longer. So, so do take advantage of that NSP questions at hud.gov. It's uh, We've, we've opened up the service, and we're hoping that you can take advantage of it. All right, so I think this is actually where we have our first poll. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Um, so we're going to put up a poll here for folks. It's active now. On the right side of your screen, you'll see the poll question. We just want to know a little bit about who's on the line today. 
So tell us who you are. Are you with a city government, a state government, or are you with a nonprofit? You just answer the poll by clicking on A, B, or C, and then submitting your answer. And we're going to give a couple minutes for that poll to wind down. Um, but just as a reminder to folks, if um, you do have any questions to ask, um, there is the Q&A function on the left-hand side of your screen. At the top, you'll see a box that says Q&A. If you click on it, a window will open and you'll be able to um, submit questions um, throughout the presentation. And we'll be taking breaks throughout to answer questions as we go along. And um, so just hang tight. If we haven't quite gotten to your, your question yet, we will circle back around and get to it. <clears throat> We've got another minute here on the poll. Again, that's the poll on the on the right hand side of your screen. Just tell us who you are, if you're with a city government, state government, nonprofits, and we forgot to include county government here. If you are with a county government, you can go ahead in your chat box at the top of your screen and just let us know that you're with a county government at the top there in the chat box. And then we'll we'll get you guys in in our count as well. There's a few more seconds on the poll. <clears throat> All right. We'll be closing this soon here, and then we'll get the results, and it'll show us who we've got on the line. Got a pretty good turnout today of folks. Um, we had 138 folks answer our poll here. And um, we've got 48 city governments, 19 state governments, and 12 nonprofits. So the majority of the folks on the call today are city governments, John. And we did have one person write in to say that they um, were with a county government. And another one wrote in to tell us that um, they're really, they check nonprofit, but they're really a redevelopment authority as a lead to a consortium. Oh, that's so. close enough for, for our services. It, I know this might be yeah. a secret, but could we just ask the next question about how many properties uh, these people, yep. these folks have? Because that to me is the, maybe the biggest variable in how we orient this. Absolutely. We'll start our second um, poll, which is up already. and. Um, the question asks, how many properties do you have awaiting disposition, including land bank and non-land bank properties? So these are all of your properties that might be awaiting disposition in your portfolio. Is it A, 1 to 25, B, 26 to 100, C, 101 to 300, or D, over 300? And again, you'll just answer that question on the right-hand side and let us know how many properties you have awaiting disposition. You can, you can use an approximate number if you're not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> but this will kind of help us gauge um, the, the volume of, of properties sitting out there that are still awaiting disposition and, and the kind of strategies you might be needing to hear about um, on today's webinar. All right. <clears throat> so we've got a few seconds left here on the poll if you haven't voted yet. Okay. And we've got our results up for this poll. So it looks like the majority of folks who answered have between 1 to 25 properties. So we've got 37 of the folks who answered with 1 to 25, 15 with 26 to 100, 6 folks saying that they've got between 101 and 300, and then 7 saying they have over 300. So we do have a few here who have quite a large um, portfolio of properties that they still need to dispose of. All right. Well, you, you have your work cut out for you, and we appreciate uh, the, the challenge that you're going through. Uh, so some of this may be less on the scale of the of the 300 plus
grantees, but uh, I think you'll still get something out of it. I think our, we're a little bit more oriented today to the to the hundred and fewer uh, grantees. But I think any time you can get some properties out of your NSP land bank, I think is uh, uh, worthwhile. So I hope that's uh, useful for you. We're going to turn it over to Marilee Hansen at this point. Okay. Uh, what can an NSP land bank do? I think all of you, since you've got land banks, know that it's eligible use C, which is to establish and operate land banks for homes, residential properties that have been foreclosed upon. And that generally means if you, due to a variety of reasons, some folks planned land banks in the very beginning and thought, well, yeah, we're just going to assemble a bunch of properties and then see if we can come up with a good project. Most, though, I think have been um, formed more because of changes in the market, where originally when you first acquired the properties, especially with NSP1, to meet the expenditure deadlines, everybody was buy, 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 and now you have these properties, and oh my goodness, what are we going to do with them? And by the time your rehabs are done, your market is shifted, and maybe folks don't want to buy in that area anymore. So land banks were formed um, in those some of them are informal, as John said, and some are actually formal through a nonprofit. Um, you must have a defined area for your land bank, which is a little different than your target area, but you could say your target area is your land bank area. The properties to be eligible must be foreclosed upon or blighted residential properties. And the definition through the unified notice, which is the NSP3 notice, actually expanded residential properties a little bit and clarified that that can be vacant land as long as it's been foreclosed upon and uh, zoned as residential. And if you want to get a little more information or a handy dandy chart for eligible property types, we have a policy alert called the explanation of property types under each eligible use. Um, that you might want to refer to. Our first one. Huh? That was our first one. Yeah. Okay. This is a chart that I'm really fond of. I don't, who, who did this one, John? Uh, I think one of the TA providers that was working with us. But I think they did a really good job uh, in actually laying out in visual terms of the land bank cycle itself. The first is the, the acquisition. And again, it's eligible properties, either um, homes or residential properties. And then you have 10 years to figure out what you're going to do with this, these properties. Now, the 10-year mark, and you're going to hear us say this a few times today, starts on the date your closeout agreement has been initiated for closing out your line of credit. So those of you who haven't closed out your grants yet and you have land banks and you're kind of worried because you think it was when you closed escrow on each of the properties in your land bank and you've got to hurry up and do something because five years has passed, that's, your clock hasn't started yet. So that's a, that could be good news. Now during the, um, the holding period, you could do, you could let the land just sit and uh, until you get something, for, uh, a viable project. You could, if you needed to, do some interim uses. Um, for example, if the homes were, say, ready for rental, you could, for various reasons, rent them out or form a community garden or do something else that would benefit the community in the short term while you're doing your redevelopment planning and assembling some type of project. And then the bulk of what we're going to be talking about today is the land bank disposition. And you can see we've given you a couple of samples on the um, far right-hand side of the, the slide where you, disposition for redevelopment or disposition as a side lot or under NSP1 as a park or public facility. A lot of folks now have forgotten that there is the availability of that public facility um, category for NSP1, which helps, up, helps out quite a bit. And the end use can be disposition only. You don't have to have um, any other type of use. 
exhibition in itself might be an end uh, use activity. Next slide, please. Okay, before disposition, you have, you are allowed holding and maintenance costs. Again, uh, the maximum holding period is 10 years from the uh, closeout date on your closeout agreement. As I said before, land banking can be an interim use. Um, at, at the end, you're gonna have to obligate the, the properties for a reduce, reuse or redevelopment. NSP can pay for things like boarding, taxes, maintenance, insurance. Um, when you're figuring if it's an act ends up being a resale situation of a single family home, you could have some static costs that would not be considered part of the total development costs for the properties that have been redevelopment, uh, redeveloped. And those could be some maintenance and repair costs. And then final, the final point we wanna make here is that you do need to procure if you're using third party entities for things like boarding and maintenance, um, fencing, security, uh, those kinds of things. Next slide, please. So what, is this, what does disposition mean for NSP? As all of you know, we follow the CDBG regulations. So you can find this at 24 CFR 570-201B. And uh, what that says is that we can sell, lease, donate, or otherwise dispose of properties that have been purchased with NSP funds. Disposition can be used as an allowable expense in an eligible activity. And it can both be an activity and end use, as I said before. So one of the things that you do need to keep in mind if you have a property that is an ineligible end use that meets a national activity, I mean a national objective, um, you may be able to take that out of the land bank without any reimbursement to your NSP program. If a property cannot meet a national objective, you will have to reimburse your program and the disposition of that property must be at fair market value. And next slide please. And this is just a little bit more on uh, the disposition requirements from the CDBG regulation. Um, it talks about you can um, sell, sell, lease, or donate. Uh, it has to meet a national objective or you have to reimburse your, your program. Um, we do allow incidental costs, again, legal document preparation, survey fees, uh, transfer taxes, et cetera. Uh, NSP can pay for the temporary managing of the properties until disposition occurs. This would be considered a disposition expense. And we can pay for disposition costs for non-NSP properties is ineligible unless a land bank is a government agency. Uh, and just keep in mind that uh, we really need the properties to meet a national objective, otherwise you'll need to reimburse your program. Okay, I think we have another poll question now, or was that our second one we did earlier? Jennifer? Sorry, yes, we do have another poll question. I had muted my own line. <laughs> okay, so on the right-hand side, you'll see our next poll question. And the question asks, what are your biggest barriers to disposition? So you just heard about um, the disposition rules, and now we wanna hear what your biggest barriers to disposition might be. A, we have dozens of properties and neighborhoods where no one is currently investing. B, we have a bunch of scattered sites and it's hard to do anything impactful. We are not organized and supported for this function. C, 
The properties were acquired and buildings demolished. The neighbors are pretty happy with that much progress. Or D, other. And if you're answering other, feel free to use the chat function to tell us what your other might be. Okay, so we've got the poll there on the right-hand side, and we've got a little bit of time left um, for you to chime in, but you're clicking on A, B, C, or D, and if your answer is D and you, and you feel like sharing a little more, feel free to use the chat box to go ahead and enter some more detail. And just an, also a reminder, if you have particular questions now or throughout the presentation today, you can use the Q&A feature at the top. Click on the Q&A feature and go ahead and type in your question and hit submit. And as we take breaks for, for question and answer, um, we'll get to yours. We've got a few more seconds here for you to answer this poll question and then we'll share the results. <clears throat> okay. And the poll has completed, and we'll give it a minute to tally the results. Okay, and our results. Most folks answered others, but we didn't get any chat um, responses telling us what that other might be. Um, but otherwise, it says that most folks are answering that they have a bunch of scattered sites and it's hard to do anything impactful um, with those sites. So about 14 people chose that response. We had 11 saying that they have um, properties where um, there are neighborhoods where no one's currently investing and then 10 folks saying that the, the buildings were demolished and the neighbors are pretty much happy with that much progress. So sort of split down the middle of our three options for the most part. Okay, yeah, great. Well, I hope we can kind of talk a little bit about some of those other answers as we get into the questions going forward. So, uh, so just for a kind of framework here, we're going to be using these four points to go through the next set of examples about what what you can and can't do with this position. So having a, an, el, an, el, an allowable expense in an eligible activity that meets a national objective, everybody knows that's going to be good, meets a national objective, eligible activity, it's good. Uh, sometimes, and this is a, a little bit of a tricky one uh, that people don't always know about, sometimes the eligible activity and the end use uh, are the same and can meet a national objective. And I'll, we'll tell you about how to do that. And then uh, one that uh, Marilee mentioned, which is you have an ineligible end use, but it meets a national objective. And so um, you're probably wondering, well, just how would that work? I will tell you in a couple of minutes. And then, of course, uh, you have an activity that never meets a national objective, and that's always going to be ineligible in both NSP and CDBG although it may not be as painful as you think. All right, next slide. So this one you can take home and put on your refrigerator um, and um, study it more closely, but you, these are the kinds of uh, activities that we see pretty frequently. Uh, obviously, housing activities uh, are, are predominant. Uh, you, you pretty much have to do housing with NSP2 and 3, and most of NSP1 was, was housing uh, activities as well. Uh, but there is uh, demolition, there is disposition. Um, one that I will point out, and it's a kind of a small loophole, uh, but uh, under Dodd-Frank, uh, we were allowed to use uh, certain uh, eligible use B activities for special economic development. And that sounds exciting, and, and it can be, but typically the, it's got to be a, uh, in order to be eligible use B, it has to be a foreclosed or abandoned residential property. So you may have some large parcels like that, but you may have uh, many small ones, and, and that won't work. However, we'll show you some examples of, of things that actually could work. 
under that. Um, and again, at the very bottom under eligible use E, as we said, in NST1 you can do uh, uh, public improvements and um, otherwise uh, you know, meet a national objective that way and support your, your housing activities uh, in, in, uh, through uh, some, some improvements in the neighborhood. So, um, so I think what we're going to be talking about eligible use C for demolition is how do we dispose of properties that have been demolished. Uh, we'll, we're going to get into that a little bit more, and I think you will start to see kind of how that might work to your advantage. And uh, we're going to go through the, the entire uh, group of possibilities, uh, starting with Larry, right? Yes. Hi, this is Larry Reyes, and uh, as John mentioned, there are four scenarios we're going to talk about. I'm going to go through the, all four, but I'm going to talk specifically about one and two before I pass it off to New Jerry Santana. We'll talk about three and four. Uh, to reiterate, decisions can be used in one of the four following scenarios. One, an allowable expense and an eligible activity, which are two categories under there. Use as a public facility, but specifically for NSP1. B, special economic development activities. Two, both the eligible activity and end use are, are eligible in and of themselves. Three, the eligible activity use is disposed of a property for an ineligible end use that meets a national objective. And four, an activity that never meets or met a national objective. Next slide, please. Scenario one, an allowable expense in an eligible activity. Use as a public facility. Eligible use E, as John mentioned. An eligible ex is an eligible expense in NSP1 and only NSP1 that meets the LMMA national objective. In the picture, you see a abandoned uh, tuplex, which was rehabbed, and it was even though the aesthetically, you know, it's painted as stucco, maybe this, and did some interior work, it is now a community uh, facility, a rec center. Um, number two, next slide. I'm sorry. This was just strategy economic development. As John mentioned, the NSP closeout notice added, quote, special economic development opportunities as an eligible activity for NSP-1 grantees and only for NSP-1 grantees. Grantees may now use economic development activities to fulfill the LMMI national objective by creating and are retaining jobs. This applies to NSP-1 only and to eligible use B only, meaning it's limited to residential property, abandoned or foreclosed. Both NSP-2 and 3 must meet the housing and our area benefit objective. Next slide. Case in point, this was a strategy economic development activities. It meets a national objective under LMMJ. It involves the employment of persons, a majority of whom are LMMI income persons, and a case in point, a home daycare center that creates or retains jobs principally for LMMI income persons. Right. One other one we might throw in there was uh, would be a, a lot, a, a cleared lot that uh, is near a, a small commercial center, maybe a corner store. You could use that property as uh, an economic development activity in a in a neighborhood setting. Correct. Um, scenario two: eligible activity and end use. Decision can be used in one of the following four scenarios. I'm sorry to repeat myself. Uh, Number two, both the eligible activity and the end use are, are, are eligible. A, use as a site lot. This is, when, once again, for NSP1 only, and probably help, will help out those scattered sites. And B, where demolition is the end use of and of itself. Three, eligible activity, use to dispose. I'm sorry, go back, please. The eligible activity, use to dispose of a property for an eligible end use that meets the national objective and for an activity that never meets a national objective. Next slide. Eligible activity and end use, site locks, allowable under eligible use B, C, and D, eligible use E and NSP1 only. A vacant or demolished property can be used, can be made available to any adjacent residential property owner in a qualified LMMI area to use and maintain as a site lot. And once again, this could be adjacent, any, the front, the back, the side. Um, and once again, uh, according to the poll, some scatter sites, this may be a, a viable option. The acquisition disposition can meet the LMM national objective 
but the grantee must determine and document the actual service area benefiting from the disposition of the property in question. So we, we came along on this policy as we got through uh, the first couple of years of the program and realized that there was a lot of anguish about, well, does the neighbor have to be low and moderate income? Do you have to sell it? Can you give it to them? Do you have to lease it to them? And uh, our, uh, our, our policy guru, uh, Jesse Hanforth Com, said that if, if, the policy, if you were working in an area where you really were improving the whole area, not just one lot, that, that, that transferring a side lot could be see, seen to benefit the area and not just the, the individuals or, uh, that, that are uh, involved directly. So, so that, if you've managed to acquire properties in a strategic way, uh, and if you're like Detroit and you have a very active side lot program, you can, you can give those away. Because remember, disposition is sale, lease, donation. Or otherwise, so uh, so if that meets your um, uh, plan for the area, and uh, you you could potentially uh, move a lot of products uh, over to uh, to the neighbors, and many times they're going to be usually have a, a maintenance requirement that they would be keeping it up. So uh, scenario two, scenario two, as, as John was mentioned, eligible activity and end use. An SP um, of a grantee has been a national objective by demolishing a uh, property. This we should have a property as a sidelot meets the LMI national objective requirement. Uh, there's no continuing affordability requirement because there are no housing units on the property being produced with the NSP fund. And at that point, the property is out of the, the NSP timeline at the time of completion because the grantee has no reporting responsibility attached to the property after closeout. So that's, like I mentioned, for scattered sites, that's maybe a viable option. And uh, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Jerry Santana, who will continue. Hi, everybody. This is Jerry Santana Carter. I want to make sure I say that. i got to start writing it more. It's been two years now. <laughs> <laughs> my husband will be upset. Um, so as I was thinking about how I was going to talk about Scenario 3, I like to do analogies. And the one thing I thought about is NSP is like UNO. Everyone has dealt a whole bunch of cards. 7, 14, <laughs> depending, and you have to get to the last card to get out. And I think everyone is either at their last card or last two cards to try to get out of this game called NSP slash UNO. So here is one strategic way, um, which is eligible. You have an eligible activity, but you have an ineligible end use, but it meets a national objective. Sounds really weird. You're trying to figure out this is an oxymoron. Is this possible? Yes, it is. So let's go to the next slide, please. All right, here's an example. We have a property that, you know, was used for uh, NSP, but you went ahead and put uh, neighborhood equipment on it um, that wasn't paid for NS with NSP funds. Um, under NSP 2 and 3, you have the restricted to housing park ineligible and you can use NSP funds to acquire the land only. So again, that means the land has been assisted with NSP, but the actual equipment was paid with non-NSP funds. And this is definitely possible. How is it possible, you're wondering? <laughs> because it meets um, LMMA, uh, low, moderate, medium uh, area benefits. All the kiddies benefit from sliding around, making a lot of noise. And in my case, I have a close to a park, and those kids get loud. <laughs> so this is definitely an area of benefit. And under NSP1, um, you could do public facilities. So it's an eligible thing is it eligible? Well, right. It's a CDBG eligible activity for two and three, but it's not right. under one. eligible. Right. So as long as you're paying for it with somebody else's money, then you're, you're good. Mm -hmm. Can we go to the next slide? All right. So we're just going to kind of go over some, I guess, rules of the road to a certain extent to, to try to fit through this particular um, window. Um, you want to dispose of an NSP-assisted property that's acquired or demolished for an ineligible activity or use such property for NSP ineligible activities. You can do this as long as the NSP ineligible activities are not assisted with NSP funds or the property was acquired under eligible use B, C, or D 
And again, remember, you can do it under E, but it only works um, for NSP only. Next slide. You can, uh, the NSP ineligible, ineligible activity will contribute to the neighborhood stabilization in the NSP target area. We kind of saw that with the first example. The initial acquisition or demolition and use of the property meets an NSP national objective. And the last way is the uh, rules of the road is the planned use of these properties. Is, I mean, you have to make sure that the planned use of the activity is described in the action plan or substantial amendment. So I know I read off a whole bunch of the slides, but um, just to go back to maybe, we don't have to go back, but to go back to slide 11, there were some examples that I think are very useful, um, and, we, and we outlined that. For example, if you do have eligible use B, you can, um, your national objective would be LMMA, uh, LMNC, or LMMU, and you can donate it to a nonprofit to develop a community garden. Um, have a couple again near the house. I think those are great. I just not a gardener, but you know it's definitely useful green space to look at. Um, under your eligible use C, you can um, use the national objective of LMMA, LMMC, and LMMJ, and you can actually donate that property to be used for a hair salon, and this will create a job, you know, for people, <clears throat> maybe some uh, some moderate to low to moderate income people, individuals. Under D, you can meet a national objective um, through LMMA or LMMJ, and this could be donated to a local business, you know, for development, and that wouldn't be bad either. Um, an eligible use E, which we said before is NSP1 only, but this could be donated to a nonprofit to develop a shopping mall, which would benefit, again, the area. So there are some definite ways that you can still, you know, say UNO <laughs> by through the disposition of an, an, an eligible activity that actually meets a national objective. And we, you might be saying, well, how do you get to D uh, <laughs> uh, for for economic development? Well, you start with B. That's how, and then you can kind of you know, once you're in the door, then you can kind of move between activities. Uh, again, if you're lucky, you're you'll have a flexibly written action plan, or you can write yourself a flexible amendment. Um, and um, I, I want, this is Mary Lee, I just wanted to throw in one other thing that uh, we don't have on our slides that you might want to consider when you're looking at end uses, is talk to your COC and look at permanent supportive housing options where NSP funds uh, could be used, especially NSP1, for um, new construction and or uh, gut rehab or donate the land to a project to make it pencil. Uh, there's a number of opportunities there that I don't think are being looked at at this point. And just one more example, for eligible use B, which I think will, I know that some communities might have issues with you know, what actually goes on the land, but you could also do a senior community center. You know, that's a win-win. You know, too many people aren't frightened of, of senior people. So, <laughs> they you know, you won't have a lot of, you know, pushback from the community, you know, and it, and it actually can meet an, um, a, a national objective. So let's just go to scenario four, please. All right, scenario four. Um, you have an activity that never meets a national objective. Uh, this is when you're holding all the cards in UNO. Next slide. <laughs> Please. Okay, so you basically you have an end use that never meets a national objective or an activity with no end use. In this case, the property must be taken out of the program using the CDBG, uh, CDBG change of use process. At the last one? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, because you're going to go. So essentially, John will go ahead and take over and explain the change of use and how that works. Maybe we should stop and have some questions, Jennifer. I can't read the screen from where I'm sitting. We do have some questions, actually. Um, so this is a question about scenario two. So let me go back a couple of slides here. Get us back to scenario two. <clears throat> so under scenario two, 
Can we use the census tract to determine LMMA area? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, we'd really prefer to see block groups if you can if you can do that. But um, the, I think the census it really just depends on how what's going on in that census tract. So if, it, if the conditions are pretty similar, uh, then that's not a problem. But if you know one one end of it's very stable and the other end of it's very unstable, then no, you can't. Use it. Okay. Another question related to side lots. How long must the side lot be maintained by the adjacent property owner once it has been conveyed by the NSP PJ? Could they split and sell it in five years, 10 years, 30 years? How long do they have to maintain it as a side lot of That's their own? Call. That's a local call. Uh, you know, I think we've seen them for maybe five years with some restrictions and then, uh, and then open-ended. There really is no HUD requirement uh, for a minimum time period. And, you know, I mean, there's going to be a handful of situations where you'd say, geez, maybe somebody made some money on that, but hopefully they did so in the process of improving the, the street, and therefore there's still some community benefit coming out of it. They need to have it defined in their uh, action plan. Okay, thank you. Um, someone is asking for some clarification on what the national objectives are in NSP. Can you just recap them? Well, the biggest one is housing. So in, in an NSP, we not only have low and moderate income, but we have middle income. So that means we can go up to 120% of area median income for both housing and area benefit activities. So area benefit is uh, probably the next biggest one. And that covers things like uh, public facilities under NSP-1. Um, demolition, for the most part, fits under area benefit uh, uh, for uh, all three NSP uses. Um, as you've heard, there are a couple of LMMJ, that's low and moderate and middle income job creating um, activities, but those aren't going to be too, too huge. Um, and then, um, oh, for the LMI limited clientele. Uh, for limited clientele for like a facility. For, for for sale properties, that would be individual uh, household benefit. So oh, you'd use still, LMI H. and 4H. Yeah. 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 So um, those are the main ones. In in the CBG program, you have slums and blight, which is a whole different category of of benefit, um, and and that's one of the reasons that NSP was a little tough to make a national objective work because we didn't have slums and blight. Uh, but, um, and then the third one in, a, in a CBG is uh, an urgent need, urgent community development need, and, and we don't see too many of those. So, uh, so it's mostly housing, some area benefit, and um, some jobs and, and income, the income of people. So, I mean, you could have a public facility that had a limited clientele, uh, but I don't think we've Used that a lot. You, could, you could do like a legal aid center with NSP1, uh -huh. uh, medical clinic, housing counseling. Housing counseling. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question. Um, I'm going to interpret this a little bit because I think I think I know what they're saying. Um, if I'm getting this wrong, um, person who sent this in, just send another question and we'll clarify. But I think what they're asking is if they're disposing of a property and they've sold it, but they cannot then um, meet a national objective, what is the jurisdiction's reimbursement amount? Would it be the property fair market value or the amount of HUD funds spent on that property? Well, that's a great segue to our next section on change of use. We'll answer that in just a second. <laughs> All right, excellent. <laughs> Let me get us back there. Give that person a star. Okay. <laughs> All right, so as a, and Jerry left off in a what seemed like a maybe a sad place that you <laughs> <laughs> you have all the cards. No, it, no national cars. objective. No, it, no eligible activity. No nothing. <laughs> um, so so we'll, we'll go through this 
one one square at a time, but it's not all that complicated. So, you the the, the use of the grant funds must meet a national objective. So that's really kind of the end. You know, what, what's your end use? And so, in the if in a sort of normal NSP scenario, you buy a house, you fix it up, and you sell it, and the and the selling of the house to an income eligible person meets the housing national objective. Um, but um, with land banks, you kind of not really sure what the end use is, or you think you know what the end use is, but you might not achieve that. Or um, so it's it gets to be a little bit uh, dicier. So, um, but you, uh, as you say, you it sounds like you've already sold this property, uh, or or about to sell it, and um, and you realize you can't meet a national objective, and so you have an ineligible activity potentially. And um, if we just turn the next slide, you'll kind of see how this works. So so there's two categories on your left-hand column there. You either, you've either spent more than 25000 or less than 25000 to acquire and improve the property. So acquisition and improvement, more or less than 25000 If you've Spent more than twenty-five thousand, and you met a national objective initially, but your your end use does not meet a national objective. Then you uh, would either, if you spent more than twenty-five thousand, reimburse at the fair market value, today's market value, or and this is the best one, if it's under twenty-five thousand, you can just demonstrate to HUD that you've actually spent less than twenty-five thousand. And then it's not covered by the change of use provisions. Um, so how do you meet? An, how do you have an initial use meeting a national objective? Well, uh, in most cases, we have been allowing uh, acquisitions of, of, of uh, dangerous properties uh, that need to be torn down, and, and the, the acquisition and the demolition are uh, an area benefit activity because that's the kind of house that kids can go into and, and get injured or uh, criminal activity takes place uh, or that sort of thing. So once you, by clearing that out, you have, uh, you have met a national objective, but you still own the property. Um, and, and so um, you, if you want to sell it, uh, you can't meet a national, if, and, and you can't meet a national objective. Somebody wants to put a helicopter pad there and uh, it doesn't benefit low and moderate income people. So um, you, your end use, your subsequent use, does not meet a national objective. So again, if you spent more than 25000 and you met a national objective, but you can't meet an end use that meets a national objective, you reimburse for fair market value. If, as in Detroit, in many, many cases in Detroit, uh, Fannie Mae gave them houses for $0, and they put a little bit of money into them, and they basically had less than 25000 into them, and um, they essentially were just able to take those out of the program because they fell below that, uh, that limit. Um, now, if you never met a national objective, the other alternative, it, and this is whether you, regardless of how much money you spend on it, uh, then uh, you have to reimburse the program for all the funds you've expended on it. Um, and that's actually kind of a... I mean, that could go either way. I mean, you you know, the property got a lost value by, after you bought it, and, and and so buying it out for current market value might not be as painful as you thought. If you could get somebody to purchase it, uh, you might kind of come out close to whole. Two two things to point out here. Um, one, I think we hit earlier that the holding costs, such as uh, board up, maintenance, cutting the grass and, this, and that sort of thing. That doesn't count towards that 25000 because it's not an improvement. It's kind of a real property improvement. Nor, if you've demolished it, does the cost of demolition. So so that 20, so getting to that 25000 getting under there might be a little easier than you thought. You don't have to, pay, you don't have to count the demolition costs and you don't have to count the, the, the carrying costs. And I think Detroit took dozens of properties out of the program that way and more power to them. And they're selling them too, thank God. So, um, all right. So, it's, it's pretty simple, but not a lot of people realize, you know, you, you kind of have this, there's a little, you know, 
little hook in there someplace. So, um, so looking at end uses, uh, special purpose end uses could be public facilities such as parks, uh, flood control. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these things. Uh, you could also have uh, under certain uh, under SP1 uh, public facility uh, standards to for those public facilities. You know. Uh, CDBG eligibility and, and area benefit if you have a community garden. Uh, and, and most of the neighborhoods we work in aren't, uh, aren't wealthy neighborhoods, and, and you can go up to 120% of median. So that's a reasonably easy uh, target. Um, I don't have a picture left in this slide, but I would encourage you to go to this DetroitAgriculture.net and take a look at some of the cool things that they're doing. And we'll have some illustrations later from uh, another neighborhood in Detroit and from Cleveland uh, for, uh, I think, some of the more interesting and kind of exciting types of uh, end uses that you can have. All right. Um, and so uh, special purpose facilities, again, could be an ineligible activity that meets a national objective. So somebody wants to pay for uh, a, a bike track or something like that in, in, in a lower income area. Um, it, if the kids are going to benefit and meet a national objective, then uh, and you can find the funding either locally or through some other source outside your city uh, or state, then uh, go for that. All right. Um, next slide, please. All right. So we've we've talked about housing, but um, there's a couple of things that you might not have thought about, and um, and one of them is it was thrown in or developed as part of the closeout requirements for what what could you do if you've still got properties left at the end of the 10-year uh, period. Uh, but if you have a community land trust in your in your town and they are looking for property and can and can actively uh, uh, develop that property even a, a block at a time or a lot at a time, you can dispose of property. To, to them uh, as well, uh, and I, I think that's actually kind of a long-term. This is kind of a good long-term strategy to keep housing affordable going forward. And at the end of, if you if you can develop a community land trust at the end of the 10 years, you could you could put you could give them a lot of property. At which point, um, it doesn't have to be under active development. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the other. Sort of post post second closeout uh, activity. Um, so, rental or home ownership units uh, on depending on needs. Back, please. Um, so, uh, you probably many of you have probably heard me say that uh, I've been impressed with how many different types of buildings and properties that we've worked with in this program. Uh, uh, Jerry was with me in, in Vallejo, California, for this incredible old uh, uh, Masonic temple that was that had a theater in it and, and was had been uh, had some loft conversions going on. Uh, we saw a really beautiful old Victorian uh, single room occupancy hotel that was converted to a facility for uh, recently incar incarcerated women with children. Um, so. Very intensive service environment, of course, but uh, uh, the, the, the building made a lot of sense for that because it was a little two-story structure, very, very uh, intimate. Um, we've had um, the, the um, Dunbar Theater in South Los Angeles, uh, also a beautiful theater, uh, and had uh, was converted to I think about 56 units of senior housing. So. Um, and then um, we also have designation for affordable housing. Again, this is kind of long term um, that you might not, you can't just declare it that way now. But if you can find an active use, uh, you can you can move forward uh, uh, with that. Um, all right, next one. All right, so I'm calling these easy wins. So uh, so we talked about the the properties where. Um, You've acquired the building, and you're going to hold. You're going to continue to own the land, the city or the county or whoever. Uh, and you've demolished a building, 
So you met a national objective with the acquisition because it was a it was a dangerous building, and you tore it down, which is not a national objective for the demolition, and you still own it. Therefore, you're done. You don't have to do anything with that property. Now, I mean, you might need to do something with it, but as far as NSV is concerned, you you can take that off the books. That's an accomplishment, and that's and that's finished. Um, same thing with the, the side lots uh, that we mentioned before. A lot of uh, a lot of good potential there, and um, there, there's other uh, uses that you can put land to for uh, community art projects uh, and and, uh, and other kinds of you know, really even lot side lot assembly land assembly for uh, community use, and um, and that uh, and that Detroit agriculture. .NET site has some very interesting uh, schemes for mowing property and interesting patterns so that you create a kind of a, uh, an artistic effect with a, what was just open space. And then the third one is the change of use, which is, uh, as I mentioned, if you've spent less than $25,000 on a property and you've acquired it and demolished a building um, or or, or not, um, you can, as long as you've met a national objective with the acquisition or the d demolition, um, you can take that pro property out of the program. You don't even have to meet a national objective. It, if, it's, if it's less than 25,000, you're done on that one, too. So I think those, uh, so those are the ones I'm kind of thinking, I, I'll bet you all have a, at least a couple of properties like that. And I was talking to do you guys with the 350, Lots, uh, all, all that much good, maybe. But uh, you know, think about you know, combining those. And, and um, but if you know, if you if you're in a scenario where you have that many properties and your your market is that low, chances are you haven't spent a lot to acquire at least many of those properties. So um, once you you know you look at that, you can't meet a national objective. You're under twenty-five thousand. You're out of there. If you're over 25,000 in, in an investment, you still, uh, but you had, you did have one national objective met uh, on going in. Then you can still uh, take it out for current market value. So, all right. Um, all right. The next slide, please. Okay, so let's see you whittle down your UNO deck and uh, the, end of the, the end of 10 years after your data close out, you still have some properties. Uh, those properties go back uh, entirely to the CDBG pro program and must be used to meet a national objective or dispose of in accordance with CDBG real property rules or they can be included in, in a redevelopment plan approved by the local governing body. And many of those, these kind of big neighborhoods with lots of properties are going to be in that category. So but again, it may not solve your problem in that nobody's going to be buying all these properties in the next 10 or 15 years, but the longer you hold them and the better plan that you have and, the, and you start chipping away at it from the edges, uh, you, you can be in pretty good shape. Um, the other categories of activities that I don't think we, um, so you can um, they can be owned by a local government or nonprofit and identified under a consolidated plan approved by HUD for use as CBG eligible improvements such as parks and open space. This is after the 10 years. Um, so these are kind of designation categories. Um, they can be transferred to any other use in the grantee CDBG program. Um, they can be designated for affordable housing in accordance with HERA, as we said, and under development by an eligible development entity which has control of the site and has expended pre-development costs. You could dispose of a property before the 10 years over if you have a viable development option. So you don't have to wait for 10 years for that one. And um, 
and again, as I mentioned, you can be you can include them in a redevelopment plan. So, at the end of this 10 years, you're not really going to go off the cliff. Uh, you you have ways to kind of go down that hillside and still survive uh, to the bottom. So I don't want any like really negative thinking out there. You got to <laughs> gotta keep slugging away, folks. Okay, so we're going to kind of quickly through um, some implications of the long-term land banking in the next slide. Thanks. So tracking. So, um, so obviously you've got to have your files and records on each property that benefits from NSP funding. There was something on one of these slides that says you should have been doing this from the beginning. Um, then, um, so you, you got to recognize that you will not all be there. We, we see this a lot already in the NSP program. All of our friends from NSP1 are gone off to become millionaires by now, I think. Um, so figure, you know, have your, have your plan be realistic about level of continuity and so forth. Next slide, please. So. Um, Property maintenance. Um, so, you, in order to qualify for the for the getting the property out of the program for free, if you've demolished a building on it, uh, or if you haven't demolished, you still have to keep those properties up. You still have to be maintaining the the neighborhood, the you know the the good influence. You want to be a good influence on the neighborhood, and so keeping it in good condition. Um, cleaning it, mowing the grass, uh, keeping the sidewalks open, and you should have procedures for responding to neighborhood complaints. Um, so that you're a, you've got to be a good neighbor to be a good land bank, I think. Um, and then I think this is one more. Um, are there specific requirements or documentation um, relative to the? periods of maintenance and so forth. Well, you, you should have, this is the, here's the line, you should have been doing this all along. So, so just keep doing it. Uh, but if you're just, if you just got this job and some goofball in front of you did not have any of this stuff, you need to make sure that you have um, clear uh, documentation on the acquisition of the property, uh, how much time you spend, employee time sheets based on the property, um, and, you know, for employees and or third-party contractors, uh, it's ideal if you can get some kind of photos and work reports to show what's been going on. Um, and um, if you have any uh, positive neighborhood association letters, that, that, that will also help you. Okay, so now we have Plan B. Well, so you still have... Um, even if you close your grant out and by calling NSP questions at HUD.gov and getting some TA and closing your grant out, you still have that time period that starts. And you have to have, uh, really, we want you to have uh, a strategy for that period. Um, I guess the one, the one uh, national objective that I didn't specifically cite is a subset of the housing, which is called <laughs> low and moderate income housing you're required to have 25% of your funds go into uh, affordable housing. So you're going to have at 50% at for people 50% of median or below. So that's your kind of deep subsidy housing. Um, and uh, so you, you've got to have a plan to deal with that when you, you sell a property. Then that sort of creates this obligation to spend 25% uh, of, of the funds that you get, including program income. For that, um, you want to look at the look at getting additional funding. You're, I know you're always looking for that, uh, but um, this is a good time maybe to think about teaming up with your local real estate community or you know, development community and see if there's ways that they can think about um, leveraging your properties into something useful. Um, so, different partners, um, particularly mission-driven partners like nonprofits. All right, so I'm going to give you something a little inspiring now, uh, I hope. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, well, let me go through these sh slides really fast, and then we'll take some questions. So the next one. So this is from Cleveland. Um, this is a great book you can get just by Googling Reimagining Cleveland. Uh, it's a terrific uh, brochure that they put together well, it was going on t 10 years ago now, but um, you know they have a lot of vacant property in Cleveland, um, and they have been aggressively uh, promoting it with, uh, as you can see, mostly green kinds of things. But um, you know it's not all cabbage. Um, there are you know, green things can be uh, drainage basins. They can be walkways. So uh, this this book this book is great because it it breaks out a number of these activities. Shows you exactly how much they cost. Um, in Cleveland eight years ago or whatever, but you know, it gives you an idea of the cost um, and uh, an idea of the plans for how to do that. So next slide, please. Okay, so we have here some uh, examples of public art that can be created. So public art isn't per se eligible in an NSP program or a CBG program, but it's one of those ineligible uh, activities that meets the national objective, and you can probably uh, find some way to do it. Um, next slide. All right. Rain gardens. Well, I don't know what's growing up. We call these puddles. But, <laughs> but really, um, water retention, and I know New Orleans does a lot of this, you know, drainage is a serious business. and. Um, and it can also be a park-like uh, kind of environment, so you can just get a feel for the level of detail uh, of uh, information that they have on how do you scope these out and, and how do you think about these. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is the list I went through before, so I won't read it for you now. Um, but um, this. So these are the things that you can do after grant closeout um, and after the 10-year period. Um, so land trust, local government, um, affordable housing, other CBG eligible use, or redevelopment plants. And then, um, so let's take some questions at that point. Okay, we've got, we've got a bunch of questions. Um, from folks who have been streaming in. Um, this is a question about side lots. Someone asks, are adjacent property owners required to purchase property insurance for the side lot? Um, HUD does not have rules on that. G generally, the, the cities or counties that are operating these do, and I would, I would direct you to um, some of the bigger land banks, like, uh, the, well, Detroit's doing a big side lot initiative, and they probably have some useful rules. Uh, Cuyahoga County and Cleveland uh, all have big side lot programs. Uh, uh, so you could, you could get, get an idea of what they find uh, to be useful because they're doing a lot of it, uh, but it's not a HUD uh, rule that, that, that you do any of that. Okay, thank you. Um, for the change of use for um, less than 25,000, is this limit per lot or property? If all lots under the land bank cost less than 25000 per lot, can we remove the program and donate to a nonprofit for final disposition? Uh, I think so. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, each individual lot is less than 25000 so you have a separate legal description. Um, you have acquired it separately. Um, you really have no further responsibility to the, to the NSP program for that lot. Um, so, I think. Yeah. If they had ten of them. They could they could put yourselves out of business. Okay. And we did that research for the bulk purpose, uh, bulk purchase. Excuse me, uh, for Pima County, and their land bank. Remember, and yeah. we found that yeah, if each lot was under. Uh, and even if you, you did a bulk purchase and you don't have the individual cost of the specific lots, um, an average cost, if it's under 25000 would apply. Yeah, that was just a couple months ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. 
How does how detailed does the substantial amendment need to be if the end use does, does meet a national objective for a public facility? Well, it doesn't have to be incredibly specific. Are you? It sounds like you know what the public facility is, though. Uh, maybe not. Um, I think you could say a community center or something like that, and then that could. It doesn't have to be. 50% basketball courts or anything like that. But. Maybe the reason why yeah. you're using the ineligible use uh, because you, the market shifted or uh, there was a disaster that occurred yeah. or a flood. We've had that problem with properties that got flooded last year and they ended up having to take them out of their program through a change of use and they, um, right. they either did that or demoed them. But they need to tell their story. In, in any case, just make sure they tell their story. And talk to your CPD rep uh, in your field office and see what they advise, because they're going to be the ones that are looking at those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does one-for-one -one replacement apply to NSP? Um, no. no. <laughs> Okay. One more. Thank you. Um, so they ask if you use NSP1 to acquire foreclosed housing with an end use of open space to return um, land to the flood floodplain. So they're saying there's no one for one replacement. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, Someone says, under NSP3, we acquired and demolished two parcels. We are in the process of conveying and donating the 18-acre lot to a developer. No federal funds will be used to develop the site. Can we use eligible use D? Can we use demolition as an end use to close out? What were the, what were the circumstances again, 18 acres? So it was NSP3. And they, um, NSP3, and they acquired and demolished two parcels, and then they conveyed those parcels to a developer. No federal funds are being used to develop the site. So basically they're asking what eligible use this could be in order to close out. Can they demonstrate there was a stabilization or a change in the community, decrease in crime? or um, the fire department saying that the, the hazard has now been removed or something along those yeah. lines? It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, so you, yeah, I, I think you, you need to establish the, the, the area benefit kind of going in and then um, what you're, what it sounds like you're looking at is a ineligible or use, uh, let's say, an end use that doesn't meet a national objective, um, uh, and at, at which point you would probably be uh, buying your way out of the program through a change of use with current market value. If you never met a national objective, then you have to reimburse the program for all the money that you spent on those, on those lots. And what if the developer were developing that site for um, low-income households? Wow. Go to heaven. Yeah. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. good there. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. So even though no NSP funds were put into the actual development, um, if the development is a low income development, then it still meets a national objective, even though no NSP funds were used. It's an eligible yeah. use that meets the national objective. And the units yeah. count towards NSP. At least twenty five. Yeah, so we have some missing facts here in this scenario. So this is definitely one you want to talk through with your with your HUD rep, um, or if you want to submit it to the AAQ, or send a question to the NSC dash questions at HUD.gov mailbox, and you can get a little help that way as well. Um, okay, like pretty, someone pretty said. Scenario, though. Yeah. yeah. Um, Someone says, I'm confused about the LMMA requirement. Isn't NSP funds, aren't NSP funds confined geographically to the areas of greatest need? 
Therefore, for example, will a public benefit need to be in an area of greatest need and an LMMA area simultaneously? Yes. It does. They, they still have to demonstrate that the area that either by nature and location of the project or the project itself uh, serves at least 51% or more low-income uh, residents in the area. The, the areas of greatest need aren't necessarily uh, primarily low and moderate income people. They usually are, but not entirely. Um, and they may be, you may have a very big area of greatest need and a very modest service area for, for a facility which might or might not have the same characteristics as the overall area. But remember, the area benefit goes up to 120% AMI. So it's not the traditional LMA that we use for CDBG. Thank you. Well, for all these, um, you can call in or write in, and if you have some more details, we'd be happy to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is very detail specific. Um, <clears throat> so, someone writes Per John's statement regarding the chains of use, if the activity of acquisition and demolition um, and the demolition itself is actually meeting a national objective, They've invested um, NSP funds, $30,000 $30, total, $15,000 for demolition and $15,000 for um, the acquisition. Can this be removed from the program? So they've got an activity that they've done acquisition and demo, um, $15,000 for acquisition, $15,000 for demo, and they're wondering if that could be removed. Well, that, I guess there's a, an important point, which is that if you are, if the public agency is holding it, then you know it's it's you're still good. If you're selling it, then you you have to go through the change of use, and um, at, at that point you might have to uh, sell it for uh, fair market value. Okay. I'll throw an easy one at you guys. What percentage of your NSP3 allocation can be used for demolition? Well, 10% unless you get a waiver, and we've issued a zillion waivers. So, yeah, Larry's mm -hmm. for those, I think. That's a, that's okay. a legislative limit. But on the waiver, you've got to justify your whole reason and rationale for the, the extra over the 10% cap. Um, what is considered immediately for land bank properties that have been, that have moved past the 10 years in terms of having to dispose of them immediately or make you know turn them over? Yeah, but they're still supposed to happen immediately. Um, I'm going to be retired then, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> they want to know what immediately means. How long is this does immediately take? You know, I would say within a couple of years. I mean, we don't like it when CBG properties are held for more than three or four years. So, you know, if it's coming in with a 10-year, 15-year tail on it from NSP. Well, but, what does a re reasonable, rational person say is immediate? All right, I know. <laughs> right. I guess, I guess. Okay. Someone said... Um, Um, we're looking at slide 38 here in this question, and they said, what is HUD looking for relative to a land bank management plan? Um, does the grantee have to make these determinations per lot or for the group of lots remaining? I didn't hear the, the land use management plan. Is it lot specific? Is it, you know, uh, it's land or? bank specific. As uh, You could have in your land bank scattered lots uh, or you have lots that are contiguous, but we're not asking for a plan for each individual property. It's how is the grantee going to handle that land bank until a project has been either assembled or they dispose of the properties 
in the manner in which is required. How's that for a bureaucratic answer? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> someone asked, did I understand correctly that conveying a vacant lot to a land trust can be the eligible end use and we don't have to wait until the land trust had built and sold to an eligible buyer if we originally acquired it in an element A or as acquisition demo of blight? Well, it doesn't have to be a completed house, but it should be on the verge of development. I mean, it really needs to be imminent. I know, it's like immediate. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> but Jesse said, well, so I asked about this, yeah. but she said, if, they, if it's actually ready to be developed, then you could do that before the end of the 10 years. And if it's just transferring it over to a land trust without any sort of deal on the horizon, then that, you can do that at the end of 10 years, but not before. What's the national objective for the disposition? Housing. I'm not going to have to be income restricted. I'm thinking DRGR, because you've got LM&A and you've got direct benefits. Mm, yeah, well, I think it would be housing. <laughs> well, I mean, we... Uh, well, yeah, I know. Um, what would help? Okay. So, well, should we get to the... Um. Yeah, um, I think I got one more slide. Um, yep, we can go to DRGR. Um, we'll come back for more later. Here. Yeah, we can come back for more later. All right. Um, did you want to do this, this, uh, this slide here, John, beyond the horizon? A teaser for a couple of slides at the end, but when we talk about an immediate uh, having a plan that be, is having land that's developed dedicated for a redevelopment plan. This is a neighborhood in Detroit called the Fitzgerald neighborhood that is redeveloped. It has a plan to redevelop every lot in the entire neighborhood. And they have 370, 373 lots that they're actively working on. And now a lot of those are just going to be gardens and things like that, but, um, but they, have, they have very specific goals for rehab and new construction. And so, you know, if, if you look, if you want to be sort of inspired by a neighborhood plan, this this to me is really inspirational because they said, well, what would it, what would it take? That was my friend Bill's favorite thing. Well, what would it take <laughs> to get this done? And they just went at it, and they got a bunch of money, and the city owned most of the land. And I'll show you some some kind of sketches at the end, but um, this is this is how how you move forward on, on those properties where you got 300 land bank uh, properties. Okay. Okay. So we'll move along then to the um, very exciting topic of DRGR. Um, and so we know that um, we're managing our land banks in DRGR um, as well as in real life. And so when we're setting up these um, land bank activities in DRGR, so these are actual land banks ac and actual land bank activities, um, not property that you're just sort of informally holding as a land bank. We're talking about um, formalized land banks here. Um, when we do this, the land banks in DRGR are established to um, record the acquisitions of the properties and as well as the holding of the property, so all the maintenance costs and things like that. We've already talked about that the land banks must meet two national objectives. First, when they are established, and then that's usually going to be your area benefit, and then another national objective when the properties are disposed. And so ultimately these properties um, are going to be used to meet a national objective through other activities such as rehab, redevelopment, demolition. Um, and so for example, if a property is acquired and it's held in a land bank and then the city later decides to rehab that property, that property is going to be handled once under the land bank activity in DRGR as part of the acquisition. And then again, under a separate DRGR activity for rehab, and that activity could either be an existing rehab activity or it could be set up um, a, new, a new activity set up for rehab. 
And as you're doing this, um, those accomplishments, such as your beneficiaries, are going to be recorded in the rehab activity. Your acquisition costs can remain in the land bank activity, but all the other costs are going to be recorded under the actual end use activity. So in that example, the rehab. And this is just sort of going back again to that concept of you're having two national objectives, one for the land bank and then one for the ultimate end use. And so you're having two activities. Now it gets a little tricky when we get to the address data. Um, the addresses should always be recorded when you acquire them for land banks. Now this is different than when you're acquiring the property just to do a rehab. Um, in those situations, we always say that when you're acquiring for rehab or redevelopment, you're only recording your address once you meet the national objective. With land bank, because that first acquisition does meet that first national objective, you are recording your address when you require it for the land bank. And so you're going to put the address in DRGR under your land bank activity when it's acquired, and then when you actually meet that ultimate end use of rehab or redevelopment or demolition, you're going to record the address again under that second activity. And this is your only exception for duplicating addresses in DRGR. And a lot of you have heard us over the years say, don't duplicate your addresses in DRGR. And that's largely true, but there is this one exception because you're actually putting the address in for each of those national objectives. And so um, your land bank addresses will not need any affordability data. Um, you're just going to put the address in and you're done. The only exception here is that if you do have properties remaining in your land bank at closeout, then you are going to have to put in a deadline date for the use of those properties. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, but the affordability data is always going to be recorded in, you know, your rehab, redevelopment activities that are actually meeting that ultimate end use. So I have a screenshot here for you from DRGR, and this is that screen that is called the, um, the address support information screen. And you get to this screen by going into maintain addresses, you find your address, and you click on enter data and you'll get this screen. And a lot of people are becoming more and more familiar with this because this is where we're recording our affordability data for those houses that are actually um, occupied by beneficiaries. And so on this screen, we have some additional blocks that are specific to land banks. And they're highlighted here in red. And so you see that we've got dates for projected disposition, actual disposition, and then a deadline. And so when you go to close out, if you still have properties in your land bank, the only boxes you're going to fill out for those addresses in your land bank are the deadline date. So you're going to put in what's your 10 years past closeout date. That's your ultimate deadline, right? And then if you have a proposed disposition date, so a date that you're working towards, you can put that in the proposed box. And then finally, once you actually dispose of that property, and this may be six months from now or six years from now, um, you're going to put in the actual date of disposition. You'll go back into DRGR and you'll update that date for the actual date. And so those three boxes are the only boxes you're worrying about for land bank properties that you still have in your um, portfolio at closeout. This next slide here is going to show you just a little bit of um, more detail. So we've got a property status. Um, option here on this address support information screen. And at closeout, any properties that are still in the land bank are going to have be marked underway. So you're going to mark them underway, and then you're going to fill in your deadline date at least for those properties in your land bank at closeout. All right. So for um, just to recap, the address support information for properties in your land bank at closeout, you can enter a proposed date of disposition from your land bank management plan. Um, you will be entering the actual deadline date, which is 10 years from closeout, and then you're going to put in your actual date of disposition when the disposition happens. <clears throat> so again, just to sort of summarize, what is it that I really need to think about 
for my land bank properties once I get to close out. So at close out, the only information you should have for land bank properties and um, in your land bank activity would be the acquisition and holding costs, the demolition costs if your demolition is not your end use. So if, you're, if you demolish property um, and you're still hanging on to that land to use for a, to meet a different national objective later, you can keep your demolition costs in your land bank activity. The addresses for those, um, the addresses for all of your land bank properties, and then for the remaining land bank properties that are still in your portfolio at close out, you're going to have that deadline information, and then um, you won't have any beneficiary data in your land bank activity. All the beneficiary data would be either under rehab or redevelopment, and so. Um, some folks might be thinking, well, why do I, why am I keeping these addresses in here? I think somebody once told me I should get rid of them. Um, but the, the reason we want to keep the addresses in the land bank activity is so that we have a record of which properties were at one point in your land bank. And so that's why we're allowing that duplication. And then this is a screenshot. I know it's very small, but this is just to show you here. Um, the different types of um, activity types that are available to NSP. And we're going to talk through here in a second about the setup of land bank activities um, as you're going to dispose of the property. And so it's good to know what your available activity types are here. And for anybody um, where this is a little bit too small, um, I did get a couple questions about where I can get the slides. Um, you can get the slides um, on the HUD Exchange. They are posted on the HUD Exchange and you can download them there um, so that you can read these a little bit more clearly. Okay, so let's talk specifically here about um, the different activity types and how we work with them in DRGR when we're using um, the land bank activity. So the, the land bank acquisition um, activity type, and so back here you'll see that under land bank we have land bank acquisition only and land bank disposition only. And so when you're setting up your land bank acquisition only activity type, that's generally the first type of activity set up for land bank. Um, that's where you're going to acquire the properties and hold them. So you're using this to record all the properties that you acquire for your land bank. You're putting the address in when you make that acquisition. You're entering all your acquisition and holding costs. Um, you're not going to delete your addresses after you've met a, a separate end use as your second national objective. You're going to leave those addresses in your land bank activity. And then your, your land bank management plan at the end um, of your program, when you get to your, your closeout, um, you're going to um, include the deadline date for any properties you're still holding in your portfolio. And just a reminder that you should almost always be meeting the area benefit national objective when you're acquiring these land bank properties. And multiple non-contiguous non land bank areas in one land bank is okay as long as each individual area meets the LH25 or LMMI area threshold. So you don't have to set up multiple um, land banks just because you have some non-contiguous land. All right, and so, um, Looking at rehab now, so now we've acquired some land, we've put it in our land bank, and now we're going to use that land and that property um, to rehab it and sell it to an eligible buyer. So in this scenario, we're actually going to um, set up a new activity or use an existing rehab activity to record the um, costs of the rehab as well as the beneficiary data and then we're going to record that address again because we're going to need to put in the continued affordability information for that address as it relates to this particular beneficiary. Um, and all of those costs, you know, related to disposition, the actual construction during the rehab, all of that will, will be recorded in this new rehab activity. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the demolition as part of the land bank. Um, if a land bank property results in demolition and the property is being held for a separate end use, so this is a situation where you, you acquired the land and, you know, the structure on it just couldn't stand there, so you had to demolish it. But ultimately, you're going to use that land for something else, so you're hanging on to it. 
Um, in this scenario, the cost for demo will be recorded under the land bank activity. And the disposition cost, which is, you know, the, the, the holding cost and the maintenance and all of that, will be recorded under the land bank activity as well. This will be an area benefit, and the address should be recorded in DRGR, um, just as you did with the acquisition. You know, we've already um, met that requirement. When you acquired it, you recorded your address, just a reminder that you're not going to get any affordability data for this. Of course, you're going to be mindful of your demolition caps for this one. Now we have a second scenario with demo, and that's where the demo is actually going to be our second um, national, I mean, meet that second national objective um, for that ultimate end use. And so if the land bank property results in demolition and the demolition meets the national objective, this is where you're going to use your separate demo activity in DRGR. And so you can either set up a new demo activity or use an existing one if it meets the other requirements for your activity setup. If demolition was not in your original action plan, then you'll need to speak to HUD about um, possible needs for a substantial amendment. But in this scenario here, because this is actually meeting our second national objective and our ultimate end use, the disposition cost will be recorded under the demo activity rather than the land bank activity. This is also going to be meeting an area benefit. And again, you're going to be recording that address in your demo activity. Um, and you won't need any affordability data because we don't need affordability dem data for demos. All right. <clears throat> and then finally, we've got redevelopment. So if a land bank property ultimately results in redevelopment, you're going to set up a new activity or use an existing one under eligible use E. The disposition costs, the construction costs, all of that information, all of those costs then related to the meeting the eligible use E will be recorded under that redevelopment activity type. This can be either the LH25 or LMMI direct benefit. You have um, beneficiary data under this type of activity that you're going to need to record. And then you'll have the address be recorded again. And then you'll be entering your continued affordability information on that support information screen for your addresses. And we do have one more here. So disposition activity type. So in this situation, um, you're only going to use this if the land bank property does not end up as demolished, rehab for sale or rent, or redeveloped as the end use. Um, so in this situation, you're going to set up a new or existing activity or use an existing activity that is the land bank disposition only activity type. Remember back on that screen with that little drop down, I showed you how we have two different types of land bank activities in DRGR, acquisition only and disposition only. So you would have acquired the, the land bank under the acquisition only, and then you would dispose of it under the disposition only. And again, this is only if you're not using it for demo, if you, if you haven't used it to meet a demo rehab or um, redevelopment end use. Um, and again, you'll be recording the address again here as well. All right, so that was just a quick little breeze through DRGR land to talk about how we would manage our land banks um, in the system. And, you know, just a reminder that this is always, you know, DRGR is always there as a way to tell your story. And so, you know, we're really trying to, to keep it really clear. It comes into the land bank, we record an address, we use it to, to record all of the acquisition costs. And then when we use it for another purpose, we're going to record it under that second activity with all of the requirements that come along with that activity. So if it's rehab or redevelopment, we're going to be recording our beneficiary data and our green measures and things like that. Um, so just really telling your story. All right. And so with that, I will turn it back to John. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm just go through these really quickly, and then you can take a few more questions. So, this is just a little more detail on this Fitzgerald neighborhood. I wanted to show you it's 373 city-owned parcels, 323 are being developed, transferred to the developer, uh, which was a local uh, partnership of two different uh, development firms. Um, they have 115 have vacant houses that will be rehabbed. 20% of the housing will be affordable for 80% or less of area median income. 
16 parcels have bladed structures that will be demolished. The lots of these structures will be landscaped. 192 additional vacant lots will be cleaned and cleared, replaced with community gathering spaces and low maintenance landscapes. And then 50 parcels will be transferred to the city to create a two, new two acre park. So why don't we just go kind of quickly through the next one. So I just, I mean, <laughs> I want one of those in my name. <laughs> you know, I just, I, you know, come on. Um, you know, and if you plant these things in, in uh, native grasses and flowers and stuff, they really kind of maintain themselves. So um, next one. Oh, now here's a good use, and the, the Cleveland book has some of these too, pathways through uh, vacant lots, um, and that connects people and connects things. Um, but, um, you know, I heard, I've never seen a picture of this, but I've heard there was a lot in um, Flint, Michigan, and you know Flint's a tough town uh, to be um, helpful in, but they, somebody planted an entire lot with sunflowers. Mm -hmm. So just think about that. You know, those things are five, six feet tall, um, solid sunflowers. Next slide. I guess the other thing that I like about this, and it's true in the Cleveland plan, is you know you look at these things and you say, oh, it's just more green stuff. But this is an orchard. This this is this is fruit that could be sold or eaten in the neighborhood. Um, market gardens are something that uh, that are uh, that people are using. Uh, wood lots. Uh, you know, people just growing trees for for lumber. I mean, that can be a long-term proposition. Next slide. Oh, yeah. So here's a couple of website connections for those and two of our more um, relevant policy alerts. So you want to take some questions? I know there's got to be DOGR questions out there that I can't answer. <laughs> Not as many as I expected, but yeah, we have a few. So um, one question asks, should we still create a new activity in DRGR if no NSP funds are used for the rehab or disposition costs? And the answer is um, yes. So you want to be able to capture the um, the the benefit um, of this investment. And so um, if you have if you if you are just disposing of it um, to someone else, then you can use that disposition only land NSP land bank disposition only activity type. Um, if you have if the activity was originally in the land bank and now you're using it for rehab um, and you're just disposing of it to someone else to do the rehab, then you know you can use that disposition type. Um, in some cases, some um, properties never were formally in a land bank. They were just acquired for rehab, but then the, the, um, the grantee never actually used the NSP funds to do the rehab, only the acquisition, but they had, didn't put it in an actual land bank to do that. And so in that situation, um, it would still be under rehab um, and you would record your beneficiary data and, and that sort of thing. Um, so some of this gets a little bit fact specific. So this is certain, this would be a great question for the DRGR ask a question. Um, but yeah, the, the general answer is that we wanna be capturing all of the benefit from the NSP program. So uh, how we do that may be different depending on your facts, but probably the answer is yes. Um, and someone else asked, um, must a grantee enter the projected disposition date or can they just enter the 10-year deadline date and then the actual disposition date? So in your land bank management plan, if you included a projected disposition date, if you included a plan for your properties, then you'd want to include that date in the projected disposition date box on that screen. Um, and then someone asked, and this is a very good question that I think we might have to think through a little bit more, but they asked, how do we handle land bank properties removed from the program under DRGR if the property is under $25,000? And so um, we wouldn't want to take them out completely because we want to maintain the record of them having been um, NSP at one point and having spent your funds on it. Um, there are ways that we can um, record this um, 
the, the history of this property by using the narrative boxes. Um, and so this is a great question and one that I think um, guys there at HUD and, and, and the DRGR team, we can talk about providing a little bit more detail on how we think this should look. Um, okay, so I think those are all of our DRGR questions actually. We've got about seven more minutes, so let's try to throw in a couple more here for folks because we didn't get to everybody earlier. Um, let's see, what steps need to be taken to request a waiver of the 10% cap on demolition? Field office. They have to write to the field office and the field office forward is forward the request to us. The field office has to basically give us blessing. And by that I mean they have to see the justification for it, the, essentially the need and how much, um, you know, what's projected cost for the demo, the area benefit. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a generic template. This is in Jerry. I just asked Blair if there was like a template letter, maybe that might be useful. I redacted for certain parts, but yeah. Yeah, to put on the exchange to help. You can send that into NSP questions. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, we <laughs> needed, I mean, this is kind of interesting because it turns out we. Record HUD records all the waivers, and the federal government records all the waivers that they grant in any given quarter, and so it all goes up to some big waiver headquarters, <laughs> um, and uh, and you you really need it. You can't just say, oh well, you know, we really need it now, and you, you got to have some some you know, statistical justification, um, but. At the same time, once we've seen that, we've tended to uh, approve them. Yeah. But, but like I said, the, the, the foot office has to concur with your need. And usually, you know, it's not a formality, but, but they look at it and say, okay, yeah, we know the area, there's a justification for it, and they bump it up to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, someone says, we have one NSP home that is currently vacant and vandalized to the point of non-repair. Can we use CDBG funds to demolish and donate the land to a nonprofit for redevelopment for affordable housing? Yeah, I mean, you, you, get into, you get into a little bit of trouble with using an, another HUD source of funds or another federal source of funds to, to fix up something that, 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 that got broken, but we have allowed uh, houses in NSP to be re rehabbed um, and sold, uh, you know, vandalized houses, for example, not, not demo and resold, but it's kind of the same principle, I think. But after any insurance has right. reimbursed the grantee. Right. Great. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, we've got a few more questions here. We've only got a few more minutes left. Do you all want to keep going, John? Yeah, let's go. Or do you want to follow up with these folks separately? No, let's go. go. Keep, go. keep going? Okay. Yeah. All right. So this person says, um, going back to the previous discussion, did I understand correctly that properties with land banking dollars committed under NSP that resulted in a demolition have met a national objective and can be closed under a demolition disposition? Yes. It, you should be, if the, if the property stays with the, the, the land bank or the city or whoever, if it's transferred, then you need to go through a change of use. All right. Um, no, no, no. I'm not saying you have that phone forever. <laughs> Maybe a minute. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. We've got um, one more, and let's see if I can understand this correctly. When you dispose of the demolished of a demolished property lot. Isn't that when the grantee needs to meet a national objective? So, if the grantee spent less than twenty-five thousand, they need the HUD field office approval. If the grantee spent greater than twenty-five thousand, they can sell it for fair market value, and the proceeds are NSP. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, it's treated as program income. 
Okay. Um, let's see, we had a couple come in here. Also, um, we have a property that we anticipate will have to be land banked, but we have not formed a formal land bank. How do we go about forming a land bank after the fact? Well, that's that's a good question. What, that's, I guess we were trying to get at that with the informal land banks. You you don't have to have a formal land bank to, to land bank properties. In NSP, you could be a municipal uh, agency, a city, or a county, and uh, most agencies like that that I know have some kind of a property uh, maintenance fund that you know they've picked up land over the years, or they you know or it's managed with other public property or whatever, so it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to set up a separate nonprofit land bank, you just have to have a, a way to sell the properties and a way to m maintain them and, you know, strategically try to dispose of them. Mm -hmm. But if they couldn't and they wanted to move towards closeout, they could form the land bank by doing an amendment in their... Uh, to their action plan. Well, if they have, if they never had something like that, yeah. But I, I, I would still say it doesn't have to be a land bank. You could have a land bank function at the city. But if, it, if it's, yeah, if yeah, it's you'd not, have to because otherwise you'd have an incomplete activity. Right. But you, but yeah, if it's not in, if it's not in your action plan, then you need to do that. But I don't think you don't have to go out and have a nonprofit. No, 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 no. Or something just, like that. just through the the grantee. When we right. use land bank, it's loose, right. <laughs> not the legal yeah. definition. Informal. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone has asked: Has the demolition cap requirement under NSP three been adjusted as part of the closeout process? Adjusted. No, no. <laughs> I think that's a no. <laughs> anyway. You mean like you went over and then it's okay somehow? Or? Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> right. Nope, it's still there, 10%, right? Uh, come in for a waiver. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so I think that that um, captures most of our questions. Um, we may have had some really fact-specific things that um, are going to be better in a follow-up to specific folks here, but um, I think we've got most of the questions that came in. Good. Great. Um, well, okay. We've got some diehards. So, yeah, we still got about um, near over half the folks still on the line with us. Um, did you all want to go over the NSP team there at headquarters and, and um, how how folks are taking up the regions and um, where you can be reached? Right. Yeah, those are our primary regions, but we still help. It's a team concept. We help each other. Um, we just want to help just get grantees moving towards close out. Okay. Great. So all the information here is up on the screen, the areas that Larry, Merrily, and Jerry are covering. Uh, along with their telephone numbers if you need to reach them. Um, <clears throat> after this webinar, uh, you will be prompted to complete a survey. Um, written responses are always appreciated in that survey, but it's not the best place to answer, to ask uh, policy or programmatic questions. So if you do have any questions like that, using the ask a question on the HUD exchange or sending it to the nsp-questions at hud.gov mailbox is a good use. Um, for those types of questions. We also invite you to sign up for the NSP mailing list on the HUD Exchange to learn about future webinars. Um, is there something else, John? Um, no, that's all right. Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to plug TA. If you guys want to get some TA for any of these things that we talked about today, um, please email the NSP desk questions at hud.gov mailbox and um, just explain a little bit about your scenario and somebody there in headquarters will get in touch with you to see if they can set you up with um, some appropriate technical assistance for your needs. Um, <clears throat> so thanks to HUD for providing this training today and to everyone on the line who joined us. We look forward to having you with us again on upcoming NSP webinars.
Thanks, Jennifer. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you.